Okay, so we are recording now. Um, and then this event, uh, once we're done, will, um, yes, absolutely. So once this event is recorded, um, I think it takes a little bit of time for us to be able to process it, but we will be making it public for anyone who is not able to attend. And we will share that on our website and social media and all the places where we usually share things. Um, Marla is asking in the chat if I could just repeat how to get to the speaker view. So in the upper right corner, upper right corner, there's an option that says um, speaker view or speaker screen, something like that. I did it already, so now it's disappeared on mine. But if you click that, you should get just a square, like a rectangle in the middle of your screen with the main speaker rather than the full list of all 23 attendees now. Um, so I've got a few housekeeping things that I'll get to first, and then I'll be turning it over to our speakers for tonight. Um, so let me share my screen with you. Okay, so what everyone should be seeing now is our welcome screen. Hopefully that's what all of you are seeing. Um, so we're getting started and there we go. Okay, so um, a few housekeeping things. Um, we will have a discussion tonight um, between Amy Meyerson and Angie Kim, two authors we're very excited to welcome to this event. Um, and we are going to have a Q&A that will be done at the end. Please enter your questions through the chat and I will be moderating the chat, sharing the questions and I'll have our speakers answer those questions to the best of their ability. Um, as I said, tonight's event is being recorded and we will share it. So spread the word to anyone who wasn't able to attend. Um, and last but not least, um, we are encouraging folks to purchase signed copies of the books that are being discussed tonight from our local par partner, Inkwood Books. Um, this event was originally planned to be an in-person event, and they were going to be at our library selling books as they usually are for our author events. But obviously, that is not happening this evening. And so instead, they will have signed copies of the books by both authors, so please consider purchasing them. I will be sharing the link um, for how to do that afterwards. Inkwood is um, currently closed due to the pandemic, but they are still offering um, online sales and home delivery. So I've ordered for, from them throughout the last two months. It's a relatively easy process and I encourage everyone to do so. I think they will also be opening back up soon um, following the uh, Governor Murphy's um, announcement today that early next week, um, non-essential businesses will be allowed to do curbside pickup. And so I think Inkwood will be included in that. So if that's an option you wanna exercise, go ahead and do it. Uh, more important now than ever to support our small businesses. Um, and last but not least, um, if you like tonight's author event, it is not the last of its kind. Uh, next month on Thursday, June 18th from 6.30 to 7.30, we will be hosting author Grady Hendricks. He is um, like a literary horror author. His newest book is The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. Everybody's reading it. Everybody's talking about it. I also highlighted some of his other recent books on the side, Horror Store and My Best Friend's Exorcism. Um, all of these books and more are available through uh, the library's digital services, such as Overdrive, Libby, and Hoopla, as are um, Amy Meyerson's books and Angie Kim's books as well. So we encourage you to buy from Inkwood, but we also encourage you to check out the library's digital offerings while our building is closed. So that's all I have in terms of sharing of info. Let me stop this screen share. Okay, we're back to Zoom. Okay, so without further ado, I'm very excited, first of all, to introduce myself, which is something I would normally do. Uh, please bear with me. This is my very first event of this kind. I'm normally very comfortable with in-person public speaking, but I've never done this before, so I'm a newbie. Um, my name is Tierney Miller. I'm the head of reference and adult services at the Cherry Hill Public Library. Um, I've been in that role for four years now almost, but I have been at the Cherry Hill Public Library on and off for almost my entire career, which is coming up on 12 years. It is my hometown library. I live in Cherry Hill, and it's a, a place I'm very proud to call my workplace. I miss it just as much, if not more, than all of you do. We can't wait to open back up, um, and I'm delighted that you're joining us for this event here tonight. I'm even more delighted to introduce 
our speakers for tonight's event. The Cherry Hill Public Library is proud to welcome best-selling authors Amy Meyerson and Angie Kim to discuss their new novels, The Imperfects and Miracle Creek. Uh, so this is not Amy's first event with the library. She visited us last spring along with another wonderful author, Lydia Fitzpatrick, to talk about her first book. Uh, so we're really excited that she was able to make it back to CHPL this year. Amy's the best-selling author of The Bookshop of Yesterdays, which is an international bestseller translated into nine languages. It's a love letter to books and to readers, and it was named a Best Books of Summer 2018 selection by both the Philadelphia Inquirer and Library Journal. Last spring, Amy joined us. I already mentioned that. This is what happens when you read off your notes. Um, <laughs> Amy has been published in numerous literary magazines and teaches in the writing department at the University of Southern California, where she completed her graduate work in creative writing. She's originally from Philadelphia, so a hometown girl, but she currently lives in Los Angeles. Her newest novel, The Imperfects, which we'll be talking a lot about tonight, just published this month, tells the story of the Miller family. Oh, and I have all the books, so I, I wanted to show them off. Here's the bookshop of yesterday's. Um, here is The Imperfects, just published last week. Yes, and I also have Miracle Creek, but you know, hold on for that one. Um, her newest novel, The Imperfects, tells the story of the Miller family. Estranged and dysfunctional, they experience the death of their matriarch and with it, the potentially life-changing inheritance of the long-lost Florentine diamond. The only question is whether or not the Millers themselves will survive it. Angie Kim is the author of the, national, the international bestseller, Miracle Creek, which was named a Best Book of the Year by Time, The Washington Post, Kirkus, Real Simple, Library Journal, The Today Show, Amazon, and Hudson Booksellers, and a Good Morning America Hot Summer Read. She's one of Variety Magazine's 10 storytellers to watch and has written for Vogue, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Glamour, Salon, and Slate. She moved from Seoul, Korea to Baltimore as a preteen, much like the character in her book, and attended Stanford University and Harvard Law School, where she was an editor of the Harvard Law Review. A former trial lawyer, she now lives in Northern Virginia with her husband and three sons and is at work on her next novel. Miracle Creek is a thoroughly contemporary take on the courtroom drama, drawing on the author's own life as a Korean immigrant, former trial lawyer, and mother of a real-life submarine patient. It's both a twisty page turner and an excavation of identity and the desire for connection. This is a ravishing debut by a major new writer. So I will say, not only am I delighted to welcome both of these authors here tonight, but I personally am a huge fan of all three of these books. I've read them. Angie, I was up late last night trying to finish your book and I'm like 50 pages from the end. <laughs> so when we're done here tonight, that is my, that's my end of evening project. So without further ado, I will turn it over to both of you. Welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Wait, did Amy disappear for everybody else too or just me? Um, uh, it, what happened? Did she? Uh-oh. Amy, Amy? <laughs> What happened? Okay, I see Amy Myers and she just joined. Oh, okay. That's like good. She's muted. Do you see her? We got her back. I'll unmute yeah, her. I, okay. There she is. <laughs> uh, so my, I don't know what happened. My internet, I, I have uh, my phone as a hotspot to back up, but that wasn't working and my internet disconnected. So I'm on my phone now, but we will make it work. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, yay. That's much yes. better. That's good. I'm just going to put it, I have this, uh, the good thing about having tons of research books is that I have lots of books to prop my phone up on. Yeah. So I'm going <laughs> to set back up the, uh, set back up my phone instead of my computer. I apologize. No, it's um, we're, we're making it work. Yeah. Yeah. This, this also happened at my very first event and I was way more panicked about it that time because it was the first time I'd done this and... Okay, are we good? Yes, sorry okay. about that. <laughs> no, not at all, perfect timing, because um, uh, I think we're, it, she just handed it over to us, so I think yes. we're oh, good. Can we, so Amy, can I start by asking you a question? Uh-oh, she just disappeared again, I think. Yes, we're losing Amy. 
Uh oh. Sorry, folks, bear okay. with us. You know what? So while we're waiting for Amy, should I just go ahead with, um, well, I'll just answer the question that I was going to ask Amy. Sounds good. Because I think we, we had sort of gone through the questions that we were going to ask each other, and all of our questions were so similar. So um, I'll just describe Miracle Creek a little bit for those of you who don't know. Oh, Amy, OK, you're back. Um, okay, so I was just gonna maybe um, this. yeah, I was to maybe just gonna do a quick summary of my book just while you're perfect. Or, or do you want to? You know what? Let me ask you the question. Um, <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about the origin story of the imperfect and uh, which I read? And I am I love like diamonds. I'm an April girl, so diamonds are my first stone. And, um, and rare historical diamonds that have been lost in time are like just such an intriguing thing. So can you tell us a little bit about how you actually got to um, just the origin story of the novel and how you discovered this storyline? Sure. Yeah. So um, I don't know if, if a little background the uh, Tyranny said a little bit about what the novel's about, but yeah, the Imperfect follows this dysfunctional family. Uh, after their grandmother dies and they realize that she has left them uh, a brooch that holds something called the Florentine diamond in it. And the Florentine diamond is a, a real diamond. It's 137 carats, so it's massive. Uh, it's like the size of a small egg. Um, and it uh, has been missing since 1918. So it was part of the Austrian crown jewels. And before that, it belonged I think we lost Amy again. Are you kidding? No, I'm still here. It worked for the full half an hour before. I know. Can you not see me? <laughs> we can see you and we can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. I'm just on the, uh, I, I signed off the Wi-Fi and I'm just on the, the internet and it's, uh, I mean, not the internet, the uh, LTE, so it should be working. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure where I got cut off. But, um, you know, I, the, so the Florentine Diamond, I thought it was a really great venue for a novel because it has this really rich history of, you know, the Habsburgs and the Medici's, Marie Antoinette wore it on her wedding day, and uh, the Habsburgs thought it was cursed. So it, it already had this kind of narrative imposed on it. Um, the way I found out about the Florentine was uh, actually through Googling it. I initially... Is Angie here too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. Okay. Um, <laughs> I I saw I was seeing tyranny, so I didn't know if if you were if you're having trouble too. Um, I initially thought that I wanted to write about the Romanov diamonds. I've I've had this idea for a story about a diamond for a long time because I love the way that stones and jewelry are passed down through families, and so that everyone who who wears it kind of leaves leaves their mark on it and sort of imposes part of their history onto the history of this inanimate object. Uh, and so initially I thought I'd write about the Romanovs, but when I was starting this, it was about a year before um, the hundred year anniversary of the Russian revolution. And there was a lot of stuff coming out about the Romanovs. So I thought I wanted to write about something similar, but you know, a different famous diamond. And the uh, Florentine diamond just kept popping up on all of these lists online of famous missing stones. And I was really drawn to the story. And when I started talking to some experts, I discovered that even within the gemological world, a lot of people didn't know much about the Florentine diamond. And so the fact that it had this rich history and a lot of people didn't know about it and it hadn't been written about in popular culture made me think that it was a good, a good venue for, um, for a novel. So that's kind of how I got to having it at, at the center of my story. And I'm really interested also in the way that inanimate objects uh, carry history and how, you know, something, uh, I was saying before, I like the way that stones are passed down through a family. But what I think is so interesting about a stone like the Florentine diamond it, is that it can have personal histories, but it also has this larger history to it as well. 
Yeah, I love it. Mm -hmm. And what I love about it is that it's so glamorous also. So there's this sort of like international caper element to it as all these people are interested in the diamond and trying to steal it and trying to, you know, lay claim to it and saying that it rightfully belongs to them instead of, to, you know, this obscure family, this private family that just sort of comes out out of nowhere. So it's so interesting to sort of figure that out. And it's such a mystery you know, as to how this family ended up with this gorgeous historical diamond and what that link is. So it just keeps you turning the pages. And I highly, highly recommend it for anyone who, you know, needs a page turner right now, which I definitely do. So, yeah, you know, to get through all of this. Thanks. Well, I felt uh, similarly about your novel in terms of it being a real page turner. Um, I love the way that you set it not only like within a court case, but within the, the courtroom is. It says, it says she's still there. So maybe it's just frozen for a second. I think it was just Me? frozen for a little bit. Yeah. Oh, maybe yeah. Frozen for I don't a know bit. what is going on. Hold on. Let me, <laughs> let me see. All right. I completely disconnected the internet. So now it should be better. Okay, um, I really apologize. Um, all no, of these, I think, you know, it, it, it creates an intimacy, right? With yeah, the yeah, audience. Yeah. When you keep <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, for sure. Yes. So I guess a, uh, a similar question that I had about your book, we can start there, is that this therapy, if you, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the therapy in it and um, as far as I know, it's real, and maybe yeah. you took one of your children yeah. to it? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll do a little bit of um, uh, just a description of what Miracle Creek is, and then um, just a quick sort of origin story on that as well. So Miracle Creek is, it's my first novel, and um, it's a literary quote and drama about a Korean immigrant family and a young single mother who's on trial for murdering her eight-year-old son with autism. And so what happens is this, um, the Yu family, who are the, who's the Korean immigrant family, they settle in a rural Virginia town called Miracle Creek. And they have a business called Miracle Submarine. And it's not a real submarine. It's something called a hyperbaric oxygen therapy chamber, HBOT for short. And it's a real thing. It's used in hospitals for things like um, carbon monoxide poisoning and wound healing and things like that. And it's used also as an experimental treatment for things ranging from Lyme disease and infertility to cerebral palsy and autism. And in the novel at the beginning, someone we think deliberately um, sets fire by the pure oxygen that's sort of, you know, running into the chamber, causing an explosion and people die. And we immediately fast forward to a four day murder trial. And so in one sense, it's a murder mystery and we sort of the readers become the jurors and we try to follow along with the story and the evidence and try to figure out what happened that night and who's responsible and sort of how and why. So it's a who done it, why done it, how done it. Um, but hopefully more than that, it's really delving into the lives of these characters, the immigrant family and what it's like to be an immigrant family not speaking the English language in a rural area. Uh, as well as sort of parents of special needs kids. And I came to the story, and with this being my first novel, I think the temptation for first time novelists is to sort of put everything that's important to you from your own life into your novel and throw it in. And that definitely happened here. So I am a Korean immigrant myself. Um, and so there's a lot of my family's history um, and my own experience as a preteen um, first, you know, moving to this country in that novel. Um, I was also a trial lawyer. So a lot of the courtroom scenes and things like that um, reflect that experience. And then probably the most important is this strand of the hyperbaric oxygen therapy or HBOT. So I have three boys. 
And all three are fine now, but they all had medical issues as little babies and toddlers. And one of them had suffered from ulcerative colitis. And as an experimental treatment for that, we tried this group HBOT therapy. And um, so I actually did this with one of my kids. Um, and so it's based on a real experience. And most of the other patients that were in there with us are um, kids who had autism and cerebral palsy. So they became really good friends and I got to sort of know their stories and a lot of that is in the novel as well. Yeah. Um, so Amy, one thing that I wanted you to talk a little bit about is just because we just talked about the whole courtroom drama aspect of my novel, there's also a lot of legal shenanigans that go on in your novel and then with your family background. Can you talk, tell us a little bit about that, especially since your family is in the Philadelphia area as well? So there's that yes. connection too. And I'm pretty sure they're also listening oh, uh, yeah. on this call. Yeah, I think I saw my mom's name. Um, yeah, so I mean, one of the things that I was really interested in, in terms of which it took me a little while to get to, was it. So, if this diamond resurfaced, who would have a lawful claim to it, and how would such a case unfold? And it took me. So, the the type of uh, there's a couple of, of other legal issues in the book, but the main one is, of course, is is over the uh, diamond, and it's a civil forfeiture case, which was something I didn't really know that much about before I uh, started talking to uh, some various lawyers and, and also someone from the FBI who was on the art task force, which was really interesting. And so the, yeah, because I assumed that if this diamond resurfaced, you know, it had one point belonged to the Austrians and it, before that had it belonged to the Medicis. So there's questions of, does it belong to Italy? Does it belong to Austria? Does it belong to the Habsburgs? Because there's some debate over whether it was um, the crown jewels were their private property or they were the property of the state. So I, I wanted to make this as realistic as possible. One of the challenges with a civil forfeiture case is that it's pretty much all done uh, through paperwork. So unlike the murder trial in your book where there could be theatrics, there isn't really like the, the theatrics of the courtroom, but it was really important to me that I get it accurate. Uh, so I, I read a bunch about uh, cultural heritage law the most famous cases of those are the Nazi looted art cases. And so what interested me about, about this one is that in those cases, I mean, there are some debates about the value of public art and whether or not, you know, even if a painting was taken unlawfully from a, a family, if it's now, actually a lot of the, the Nazi looted art has ended up in American museums. And, you know, so there is a, while there is that question of, does it serve a purpose being in a museum as opposed to if it's returned to the family and it's either sold or it's kept in a safe? So there are some uh, ethical questions there, but I, I found it really interesting. But there's sort of a clear line with that in terms of it was something that was taken from a family that was rightfully there. So of course, it should be returned to them, most likely. Whereas with something like this diamond, I was interested in the idea that it was a family who maybe had taken something that rightfully belong to a country. And those questions become a lot murkier in, in, in that scenario. Uh, so I talked to a lot of experts about that. Um, I think you're also, so one of the main characters, her husband is in a bit of legal trouble in the book. Uh, and also there's a gemologist in the book who's had some legal trouble in the past. And actually both of those uh, stories were influenced by my dad telling me about some cases that he's had in the past. Um, that just kind of stuck with me. And um, it's very, I guess it's probably very useful to be a lawyer too, but it's useful to have a lawyer in the family when you're writing about the law because there were certain questions that felt like they were too simplistic to ask these experts that I didn't know personally. Um, whereas I felt like I could ask my dad pretty much anything. Um, one thing that I love about that is that, you know, my husband and I are both lawyers. Um, and so we're always boring our kids, like telling them stories from our careers and blah, 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 or we'll have like dinner with former clients or whatever, 
people bore them with stories. And I, I just get the feeling that they're not really paying attention. So it's really nice to know that you actually paid attention to your dad's stories because that's sort of how they get handed down, right? Like, and I love that. That's so yeah. great that, that you remember that and that you sort of paid tribute to that. I bet your, your kids remember and retain more of your really career don't too. That, but no, I don't think <laughs> that, but that's fun. <laughs> um, so what, what was your career as a lawyer? Did you work on murder trials or? No, um, I mean, I did a little bit. I did a lot of appellate work on um, sort of in the, like sort of the today. It, it wasn't an innocent, innocence project back then, but I did a lot of work on capital um, punishment cases, trying to get those overturned based on uh, issues of racial disparities. Um, and I also did uh, some internships and things like that for the DC Public Defender Service. And, but I was mostly in pra private practice. And so it was mostly like pro bono work when it comes to like um, uh, abuse cases involving both children and sort of, uh, and sexual assault cases and things like that. And I also did a lot of civil cases too, you know, just sort of representing companies and hospitals against claims and things. Um, but I did love being in the courtroom. So the courtroom theatrics is definitely like where it was at for me. And if, it, if most of my practice had been that, I would have stayed probably <laughs> being a lawyer. But unfortunately, that's like 5% of actually being a lawyer is actually being in the courtroom. So um, so I feel like actually writing this has been sort of the best of both the worlds. I don't have to deal with all of the lawyering stuff that I hate, but at the same time, I get to sort of revisit my time in the courtroom. And it sort of feels like that, except that it's better because I can actually have the witnesses say and do exactly what I would want <laughs> them to do and say, which never happens in real life. Like they never do the stuff that you like tell them to do. Oh, which is so frustrating. So this was actually a breath of fresh air and very, very fun. Yeah, I love that. Um, and one thing I feel like that's really present for both of our books is this element that we sort of thread together this mystery, you know, of, you know, in your case, it's sort of like, how did this, this grandmother who just passed away come to possess this you know, this historically significant diamond that's been missing not, and as well as the question of what's going to happen, you know, what is going to happen to the diamond, who's going to actually end up with it. And then um, you marry that with the family dynamics and this, like, I just loved your book because it came right after I was reading a whole bunch of novels that were very like serious and whatever and yours while it has that importance, it also has that hilarity. Like the family is hilarious and they just made me laugh so much. And I love their dynamic and the way that they were so witty with each other. So I love how you married those things, those threads together into yes. this one. Yeah. Can you, can you say a little bit about sort of humor in um, your writing and novels and things like that. Is that something that you're drawn to in reading as well? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I had, so one of the things I would, uh, it sort of answers like a couple of your questions is this book came a lot easier to me than my first novel, perhaps because it wasn't, it was my second time doing it. Um, but one of the things I learned writing my first book, uh, and I actually learned it uh, from reading my friend J. Ryan Stradal's work. I don't know if you've ever read him. Uh, his new book is The Logger Queen of Minnesota. And before that, he wrote Kitchens of the Great Midwest. And what really strikes me particularly about his first book is you can just tell how much fun he had writing it. Um, and I've actually seen him, him read and he sometimes laughs like before he says a line that he knows is going to be funny, um, which is great. And so, and I realized that my, my first book, I think because I rewrote it so many times that it at some point I stopped this sounds terrible but I stopped having fun while I was writing it and so with with this book one of my main aims was that you know I'm, I'm very interested in in my work in general and in, in that quality which I think is different for every book of what gets people turning the pages and keeps them turning the pages 
but one of my goals with this book was that I just wanted to have a lot of fun while I was writing it. And particularly, you know, there's a lot of heated arguments in, in there and yeah. it's easy for arguments to get melodramatic, but I think there's also a lot of room in arguments to be funny. And uh, I think, you know, with my, I, I don't think my first novel was uh, exhibited that much of my humor. And I think that was also in part because it was first person. So this book is third person. Um, and I think that that gave me the ability to kind of impose some of my own tone on scenes and even though it was like in the perspective of different characters from a, a close third yeah. or an omniscient third it uh it allowed me to i guess uh have a little bit more fun as an outsider writing their story rather than than inside and your your book is also third person shifting between characters um why did you decide to do third instead of first so my book starts actually with first just for one chapter. Right. Um, and I did that just to for a character, the um, immigrant um, family's mom, um, and she both opens the novel and closes. And then the rest of the novel is all in third from seven different characters' perspectives. And I guess I did that for a couple of reasons. One is. I think for um, when something like this happens and you're trying to figure out what happened to cause a particular event, I do love that sort of Rashomon quality where you sort of go from one perspective to another and you look at the same event and they're overlapping and you can sort of see like how based on your assumption, what you might have thought about sort of the who done it or how done it element can change as you hear from different characters on what their experience was. And, and, and so it really, I think, illustrates that your assumptions that you bring into a situation can really drastically change the way you look at a situation, which I just find fascinating as, you know, just the way that we tell stories to ourselves, to each other. Um, so that was something that I wanted to do and that I thought would be fun from the mystery angle. And just, I, I think it's, it, the other thing just goes back to the fact, fact that this was my first novel. So I just wanted to just, I was hungry to sort of um, explore everybody's point of view, you know? So I wanted to sort of like see what everybody would think about a particular event or whatever. And I do think that there is um, a simplicity that's just so wonderful about following one character in first person all the way through. Um, and I do love, I've ri loved writing stories like that, but I think because this was my first one and I was just so anxious to just sort of cram everything in there that I um, ended up uh, telling the story from so many different perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, well, I thought it worked really well and I especially liked how I think I said this to you before, um, you didn't impose too much order or neatness on it. Like the book is very ordered and organized because it's within the court case, but um, you know, you, you let characters have space where it makes sense for them to, rather than keeping it very orderly. And I think that that worked really well, particularly for a courtroom drama. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so actually that, that brings me to to a writing process question that I had for you, given that we're talking a little bit about mysteries and sort of how they unfold and things like that. Love to know if you outlined everything beforehand. Like, did you know what was going to happen? Because um, it was so fascinating. There were so many strands that came together. There was like the family dynamics and sort of what was going to happen like within intra family and then there was like all the international stuff that was happening and then there was like the mystery unraveling of the origins of the diamond diamond and the history of the diamond as well as what's going to happen with the diamond now in the current day so like there were just so many different things that had to come together it makes me feel like you must have like outlined it and planned it beforehand? Are you a plotter or are you a pantser? Uh, somewhere in between. So I definitely, so one of the things I learned from my first book, um, The Bookshop of Yesterdays, is that it's a lot easier to write a book if you know where it's going. 
Uh, I, with that one, because it's a scavenger hunt through novels. So I organized ahead of time in terms of like picking out the books that, that went into the scavenger hunt, but I didn't really know what I wanted to have happen in the story until, I don't know, the fourth draft. And then when I uh, started working with my agent and then an editor, the whole narrative changed. And so not only did that take a lot of years, it was, I think that's part of why the, I was saying before it wasn't as fun of a book to write because I just kept rewriting and rewriting. So with this one, I wanted to make sure, you know, a lot of people say that writing an, another book is kind of like reinventing the wheel, but I wanted to make sure that I learned something from my first experience. Mm-hmm. And for me, that was uh, th- knowing that I need to have a plot organized before I get started. So I don't um, outline in a traditional sense, but I knew where the novel started. And I realized that in order to write it, I had to know what happened to the diamond and how the grandmother had it. And then to a certain extent, what happened to the diamond at the end of the book. Right. Um, so I kind of had this art, like general arc for the story. And I do think in order for me, for me anyway to write, it's a good idea to know where I want to start and where I want to end up. So basically what I usually do is every day when I write, I kind of plot out what I'm going to do the next day so that when I sit down to write, I have momentum. Um, but I didn't have the whole everything figured out. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. What about you? Um, I, you know, who knows what my process will be for the second one. Um, I'm trying to figure that out right now. Um, but for my first, um, I really am, uh, I'm not a, I, I can't really outline before, or at least I didn't, I didn't for Miracle Creek. So for Miracle Creek, for the main mystery, which is like who set the fire and how and why, I didn't know the answer to those questions until, I don't know, I was maybe a year into the process of writing. So maybe like halfway through, a little more than halfway through the first draft. And, um, and I, I knew that I wanted, like, so, you know, I did have a, like, maybe very quick one page outline before I started, but like my outline for the end of the novel said something like, we find out at this point <laughs> who said the fire. <laughs> you know, and whoever didn't set the fire explains, you know, or somehow it comes out and whatever. So I clearly had no idea. And also not only that, but the outline that I did have, once I was like maybe three chapters into drafting my novel, I had to throw away because it was completely veering so significantly away from the outline that I had drafted that I was like, okay, this just is not making sense. So I call my outline process the iterative outline where I like outline what I would like it to be. And then I realized after I write a couple of chapters that like that was totally wrong. And so then I redo the outline and then the same thing like happens again in a couple of chapters. And, um, so I just, I feel like that my, the kind of writer that I am, I, I have to be satisfied with the first paragraph, like first and foremost, before I can write the rest of the chapter or the rest of the scene. And I have to be really satisfied with a particular chapter and ha- feel like it's really well polished and the kind of thing that I could send off to a publisher or an editor or, you know, any readers or whatever before I actually move on to the next chapter. So unfortunately, that sort of like a little bit of a perfect perfectionistic quality that I think is gonna make it, it, it that makes me a very slow writer. And I wish I could sort of do something different. Um, I'd but then when you have a draft, what it's you pretty think polished. About sort of the, you've talked about this a little bit already, the first, first. Yeah. What were you saying, Amy? Oh, I just said, but then when you have a draft, it's polished, which is nice. It is nice. So it's polished at the sentence level. So I feel like <laughs> I'm happy with the sentences, but you have to change everything because structurally, once you reach the end, you realize like, oh, this is what my novel is, which I didn't realize what it was until you're actually done with the first draft. Yeah. So 
you know, so a lot changes, but it's true that I am happy with the quality of my sentences at the sentence level, but sadly not at the story, you know, like novel level. So, yeah. Um, so tell us what you're working on next. Uh, so I'm in the very, very early stages of a new book, um, but it's about, it's going to be on the large scale. It's sort of about the uh, history of the wine industry perfect time to take a sip in, in the U S. Um, but I'm, I don't even remember, I have to figure this out before I write the book and start doing these events. I don't remember when I first learned this, but I, I I think it was at a vineyard. I learned that during prohibition, um, in Northern California, not so much in Southern California, a bunch of vineyards were able to stay open because they made both sacramental wine and, uh, people were allowed to make homegrown wine. So they would buy grapes from vineyards and then make their wine at home. And I just found that so interesting, um, especially because most of what you hear about prohibition is not, it's about liquor, right? It's not about wine. And so I, I became really interested in that. And so my oh. book is going to tell the story about a hundred years of this family run vineyard, which will be the oldest uh, vineyard in um, Santa Barbara County. And there's going to be a little mystery thrown in there as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm at the plotting stage. I've been reading a lot about wine and drinking a lot of wine, um, which are fun, but they're not quite as fun as like getting to go to vineyards and talk to people who make wine. So I'm really looking forward to when I can do some hands-on research. Um, Cause I think that that's the, for me, that's the most fun researching. It's when it really comes alive uh, getting to talk to people. I really love that. And oh, because thanks. my first novel was um, so grounded in sort of my own life, I didn't have to do a lot of research. So I want to hear more about sort of research and um, especially like I, we talked a little bit about your legal research, but like just the historical research that, you know, and how you decide to depart from sort of what's sort of factually established in history versus where you let your, you know, fictional narrative uh, take you, take over the story and things like that. I'd love to hear more about your research, mostly from a selfish perspective, because I'm going to have to do a lot of research. Yeah, I want to hear, after this, I want to hear what you're working on now. Yeah, I, I've always loved uh, researching. I have, you know, for this book, I didn't really do it, but I've, for some other ideas that I've one day we'll write. Um, I've done a lot of archival research, um, and there's something really special about that. If, if you're, you go to these archives and you're researching something that you, it feels like nobody else has looked, you can kind of tell in the archives like what has been thumbed through a lot and what hasn't. Uh, but the, you know, I think it's sort of the same thing, right? When you write from your own experience, it's because you have stories in your life you really want to borrow and. Uh, since I didn't for, for this book, certainly, um, I just looked to history to create the plot. And it turns out that there's a lot of really great stories <laughs> in history. And that's, I mean, that's what interests me about history is, you know, the way it's a collection of stories. And so uh, what, I, what I learned from The Imperfects was I just started reading about the past and I found these tiny, tiny moments, this like one moment in the Austrian empire and this one moment later, I'm not gonna spoil anything, that I, they were just a paragraph. And then I could kind of flesh out in my mind sort of around that, uh, what I wanted to have happen. So for the plot of, not the plot of the imperfects in the present, but the plot in terms of the past and the secrets, I basically just took two points of history and merged them. Um, I'm, I'm also really interested in, and it might, in some ways I think, it, at least for me, it makes it easier. I'm really interested in research, but I'm a little intimidated by historical fiction, because I think there's so much more that you have to, like for this book, I had to sort of understand what happened in the past, but I didn't have to understand necessarily the quality of life in the past. And I think with historical fiction, there's, there's that extra layer. And so I don't know where, my new book I think will go into the past more. I don't know where that like off switch is, where you're like, I know enough about this that I can stop researching um, and just fully feel confident in what I'm writing. But I tend to, I guess I tend to do both at once and I definitely over-research. Like my phone right now is on a stack of, I don't know, 10 books about winemaking. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know that I need to read 10 books about that. Um, but I like to, I like to feel over-prepared. 
No, I love that because I think one one of the things as I'm right working on my next novel, which is not as grounded in my life, is just this feeling of like, oh, I, I like I, I feel a little bit like more of the imposter syndrome. You know what I mean? Like, uh, which you feel anyway, or at least I feel anyway. As oh yeah. Anyway. But um, I sort of feel like, do I have the right to be writing this? Do I have enough? knowledge and you know to be able to write about what characters are going to be feeling in this kind of situation and things like that and things that I didn't really have to worry about as much with my first novel just because I did feel so grounded um, in my own experiences so that's going to be hard for me to deal with and I think I'm going to be texting you a lot when I'm yes. <laughs> deep in the drafting of this next one yeah well, one, one thing that I think is helpful, so one time I heard um, one of uh, my favorite books is, uh, wait, why am I forgetting, is a Francine Prose book, uh, Lovers of the Chameleon Club. Um, I don't know if you've read it, but when I heard her speak about that, she described the book not, because it's set in the, um, during World War II, um, it's not, and, and also a, be, later as well, um, she said it's not historical fiction, it's just a present novel set in the past. And I thought that that was a really good way of thinking about, um, I think all research, right? But certainly historical research is that, you know, people, even if the conditions and as I was saying before, the quality of life is different, emotional truths are still the same, right? So I yeah. think, you know, yeah. there's, and I, I liked thinking about, I liked yeah. thinking about it that way because there's a certain freedom there of you don't have to feel, I mean, you're telling a, story about the past to a contemporary audience who hasn't lived through it either. So, you know, there is that expectation that you bring some of your yep. present experience into it. Can you tell us any more about the subject matter of your book or are you? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, so my next novel, it's, it's called The Happiness Quotient. And so at least I have the title, if nothing else. Um, <laughs> and it's about a 10-year-old boy who is nonverbal with apraxia and autism. And he goes on a walk at the beginning of the novel with his father, who is the primary caregiver, but only the boy returns home. And because he's nonverbal, he can't tell the family or the authorities what happened on the walk with the dad. And his, um, the little boy's um, older siblings who are fraternal twins, like 17, 18, one boy, one girl, they become obsessed with using new assistive communication technologies and therapies to um, try to help their little brother find his voice and try to tell them what happened that day and solve this mystery. Wow. So do you know what happened to yeah. the father? Yeah. No idea. No idea. <laughs> I had no idea what happened to the father. I really hope they're actually from a, um, the family is actually from a short story. That's probably the favorite, my favorite thing I've ever written. And um, I really like the father. I really like the family. So I really, really hope that the father is alive, but I have no idea. So <laughs> I love yeah, that. I have to figure that out at some point. It'll probably yeah. be like, Two years from now, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. But I think that um, you probably be you bring that discovery questions. to the page, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, um, should we take questions? Sure. Okay, Trey. So I'm um, I'm just unmuting myself now. So we have had a few questions come in, and I will. Um, our first question is to both of you. Um, how long does it take to complete a novel? Ooh. Well, well I Amy, had, you can talk because you have more experience and I'll tell you <laughs> what. Well, I also had a, a range of experience. My first book, I think I started, it came out in 2018 and I started it in, I think, 2010. It doesn't mean it took me eight full years, but it took over the course of eight years to write it, get an get representation uh, with an agent, to get a publisher, and then to publish it. Um, so that yeah. that was a long time. My second book, I I think it was about two and a half years 
from when I started it to when it published. So that was a lot less wow. time. Or maybe, yeah, you know, I'm trying to think. I started it about six months before my first book came out. Yeah, so I, it took me about two months to write, and then there was a six-month period after I finished it where it was, you know, going through the publishing wheels. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Did you say that it took about two months? To, did you say that it took two months to write? No, no, no. Two years to write. And then about six months, two years, years, <laughs> years. years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, two months would be uh, crazy. <laughs> I was going to say, wow, two months. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, for me, I mean, again, who knows with the second novel, but for the first one, I started in 2012, but for the first six months, I didn't actually write. I just sort of like got to know the characters by doing a lot of uh, free writing by hand, which I can't even read, so it, it, it <laughs> doesn't really count as writing. Um, and then um, I really started writing in earnest in 2013, got done with my first draft at about 2015, so two years. And then I took the next year to sort of revamp and revise and shorten, mostly cut a lot because it was like probably twice the length that it ended up being. And then I got my agent and you know all of that sort of stuff. So probably yeah. three years to write and honest. Yeah. Were you working while you? I, I mean, I was in the sense that I was at home with my kids, but I didn't have an outside job. So I, yeah, I, I consider, so being a writer is my fifth career and I started writing in my forties and I really, and uh, for 10 years or so, my fourth career is, you know, being an at home, full time, stay at home mom. And that was just, you know, that was just, I think the most challenging thing that I've ever done. So, yeah. I, I would say the same. I did it for three years as well. <laughs> it's, it's a lot, especially when you don't have an outlet that's outside the home. Cause, cause I think psychologically, um, you know, from a mothering perspective, at least for me, um, when you don't have anything else like I just tend to put all of my type A tendencies into my kids, which is really not healthy for my relationship with them and <laughs> my overall well-being. So it was really, really difficult. I, yeah. 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 I know, I know the feeling. Well, another question that we had, this one comes from Marla. Our last question was from Karen, by the way. I don't, I don't want people to feel left out, but this question comes from Marla. Uh, what's your best advice, and this is to both of you, for someone who wants to write a book? Ooh. Do you want to go first this time? So my, yeah, sure. So my, my main advice to anybody who says that they want to write a book is and this comes directly from my own experience because I don't have an MFA. I didn't like study creative writing and, you know, a university setting or anything like that. So what I did um, to become a writer um, is actually to sort of experiment with shorter pieces. And so I, my main advice to anybody is to actually go ahead and try to write the shorter pieces, whether it be short stories, essays, whatever, workshop them, you know, find, you can find local workshops somewhere near you, or you can find workshops online. Like I went to the Gotham um, online writing classes, uh, which are, I think our in-person ones are in New York, but I'm not in New York, so I just did it online. And just that process of showing your work which I think takes a certain amount of courage, you know, as a new writer to show your work to other people, get feedback from lots of different people, and then really go through the process of even trying to figure out, like, what's the feedback that I trust that I want to actually incorporate into my revisions and going through that process of revising and editing and then submitting, you know, like to literary magazines, which means reading literary magazines, finding out what literary magazines are out there and trying to figure out you know, how to submit and then dealing with the sort of psychological and emotional impact of getting rejection letters back from them and you know, which everybody will get. And I have so many. And I think that, and then working with an editor to edit that 
short story or whatever, and then, um, and then finally seeing it in print. I think that whole process is so valuable um, that I really highly recommend that. And also, I think that when you do um, you know, finish a novel or book, book length project, and then you try to get an agent, then you actually have something to list that's going to you know, make them take you more seriously. And I know that my agent um, told me she, she uh, I, I was in her uh, slush pile and um, she said that that's one of the things that made her actually read my sample was like seeing that I had actually published stuff, you know, because not everybody does. And I, so I do think that that's a really great way to sort of prepare yourself both like from a writing craft perspective and also just psychologically. Amy, what do you think? You teach, yeah, you I teach mean, this stuff. That was a fantastic answer. I, I like, I was also in the slush pile. Um, I did, after college, I worked briefly in publishing at a literary agency. And somehow when it was my turn to try to find an agent, uh, I didn't remember like anything from my experiences as an assistant, but I, I did have a few yeah, I did have a few connections in, in publishing, but my agent that I decided to go with, I didn't know her. And so I also just sent out a cold query. Um, and I always tell people like when I teach uh, query workshops and stuff like that, um, that you don't need, you just need to have a really good, I mean, that certainly what you're saying, the background or have a really good hook and idea for a story that's gonna grab someone and make them wanna read it. So you don't have to have connections in order uh, to get someone to represent you. You just have to have something that they're excited about. I did go the um, yeah. graduate school route, but I certainly don't think it's necessary to write a book. I mean, the thing that's nice about grad school, if it's at the right place in your life, is that it gives you time to write. It gives you a community of writers, which as you were saying is so important. Um, and it gives you the potential to uh, have mentors. And so all of those things are, are really, important, but I think that they can certainly be replicated in taking, I've taken community classes as well, taking community classes, finding writers groups. I think also finding reading groups like book clubs is, is really helpful too, uh, to hear, to have, you know, there's, Very I've been in book clubs that are really just wine drinking clubs, but if you can get into, which is great also, um, but if you can get into a, a, a book club where people really talk about the book, it's so useful to hear other people's responses, even to work that's not your own. So I think I would second everything you said and yeah. then just add those two little things. So we do have some more questions. Um, this one is for Angie. How does writing yeah. fiction compare to writing on the Harvard Law Review? And this comes from Karen. Oh, okay. Um, so much harder. Um, so writing fiction, I actually wrote an article about this. Um, it's called, if you Google Angie Kim, or not even my name, but just how not to write a courtroom scene or something like that, you'll see it. And I talk about how being a writer as a lawyer is so different from being a writer as a fiction writer and how much easier it was for me to write um, law review articles or write courtroom, um, you know, courtroom um, questions and things like that. And I think it's because when you're writing about like the law and things like that, your only aim is to sort of clearly communicate your ideas. So there's a lot of angst and research and, you know, um, trying to make sure that the logic of your argument that you're making um, follows and that it makes sense and that it's something novel. So, so there's a little bit in terms of the intellectual uh, logic that you're following that's challenging. But as far as the actual writing is concerned, I didn't care as a lawyer whether my words flowed beautifully or that the rhythm like had a, that there was a certain rhythm to it or um, any of that kind of stuff that I now care about. Um, and so to me, when people would say like, oh, I'm blocked, you know, like I'm, I'm blocked as far as writing, like I have writer's block, I just didn't even understand that concept. So why is that so hard? Like, I understand being nervous about, 
you know, being on stage and giving a monologue because you could like forget your words or, you know, you could, if you're performing music or something, then, you know, your voice could crack or you could forget, like, or your fingers could slip. But if you don't know what to write and it doesn't sound good, you just revise it. So it just didn't make that much, like, it. I didn't even understand it. But then when you start doing creative writing it's not only sort of the flow of your ideas but it's also things like the rhythm and you know like just are, do these are these the best words is this word the best and if should i put a comma here or a dash or an m dash or should I put a semicolon and or nothing at all? And the way that you make that one little tiny decision can change the rhythm and the flow of the entire paragraph, which can like change the entire rhythm and flow of the entire scene. So then all of a sudden, just every little thing becomes so important. And I didn't really realize that as a lawyer. So I would say that this is so much harder but also like so much more fulfilling and so much more fun once i'm done i i'm very much um dorothy parker said um you know i hate writing i love having written and i so subscribe to that and i love having written so much but i really do hate the process of actually putting down the words like for the first time on a blank sheet of paper so yeah it's tough i think most writers do yeah, which is it's it's confusing to to like devote yourself to something that feels a little bit like small scale torture the first first few go arounds. Yep, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So the Angie, you kind of segued us nicely into another question that we had in the chat, which was, "How do you deal with writer's block? What kind what kind of strategies do you have if you get it?" Oh God, Amy. Do you, yeah. Yeah, I um. I think, well, so I, to quote another person, um, I remember in college, uh, Michael Cunningham came to speak to us who uh, wrote The Hours. Yeah. And he said, I, I haven't done this, but he said that while, when, while he writes, I don't know if he still does this, he keeps a journal and writes every day about how he's feeling about what he's written. And that when he finishes a project, he can't remember which sections were written on the days where he felt good about his writing and which sections were written on the days where he felt bad about his writing. And that has always really stayed with me that our perceptions of what we're, what we're writing are not accurate reflections of what we're actually, of the quality of the work. So whenever I'm feeling stuck, I tend to be, I think writers either have goals of like a certain amount of words a day or a certain amount of time. I'm, I've always been a like, you know, you write for, for three hours every morning type of writer. And so if I'm not feeling it, I just sit there and, and, you know, I might only get a couple hundred words. I might get like 200 words out instead of 700 or something. And, and, but I just keep, I always return to that idea that uh, while I'm writing, I'm not really an accurate judge of the quality of the work that I'm creating. And that helps me kind of just push through even when I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. I, I, um, very much of a subscriber to just write whatever and I it, the thing that you're writing could be I don't know why but I am having a really hard time writing right now I wonder if maybe and so I'll like psychoanalyze myself in my writing so I'll be <laughs> like going I wonder if I'm having a hard time writing the scene because this is making me uncomfortable or I don't really believe what this character is doing or whatever it is but just the act of typing something with my fingers just sort of makes it so that I can move forward um, a little bit. And it makes me feel like I'm being productive even if I'm not actually drafting the scene per se. Um, but, and then there's a great um, software that I love called Write or Die. It's like 20 bucks for a lifetime uh, right to use it or something and it's it's, it's hilarious because what happens is you can control it and you can sort of say if I don't type anything for like then you can choose 10 seconds or a minute or whatever it is then you can have it start doing making really awful noises at you 
so you can choose you can choose like a baby's crying you can choose um you know fingernails on the chalkboard which is my setting because or you can like choose like a witch cackling or it, like there are so many different things that you can choose and there are like 50 things that you can choose and um and then if you're really feeling into it they even have an option that if you don't type anything for a certain number of seconds or whatever which again you control then it starts deleting your words so it's like really real it's wow. like drastic. yeah and so um so i i really like the software because it does make it so that you have to write something and it might be just like you just typing whatever like you can just be typing nonsense words but you have to write something and so i think that's always a good thing to try to force yourself to do huh. i've never heard of that before write or die write or die yeah uh -huh. it's so good yeah <laughs> Well, I've had friends who've, um, they had a contract with each other where if they didn't finish their novel by the end of the year, they had to cut off all their hair or something like that. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, it's whatever motivates you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had a question for you both. Um, and Angie, you touched on it just a little bit, but how, if at all, has being quarantined during this pandemic affected your writing process emotionally? process-wise, day-to-day, et cetera? It's, for me, I, it's just been so hard. Um, I just haven't really been able to focus. Um, I haven't really been able to um, produce. Um, and I've done, I, I've done a lot of events, so it does make virtual events, so it does make me feel like I'm being productive and I have done um, some essays and things like that. So, but as far as my next novel, it's a lot of hard work. Like this is the time when I'm having to really create the world of the novel and the characters from scratch. And I feel like that takes up so much mental bandwidth. And I feel like that creative, um, space isn't available to me right now because I'm using so much of that bandwidth to worry about what's happening and deal with my kids and you know I have one who's going to college in the fall and we have no idea what's going to be happening and it, it, so things like that so I think it's been really really hard and I'm going to try to get myself into a process where I'm at least taking like an hour a day, like I'll start slow, maybe even half an hour a day, where I'm just sort of forcing myself to just try to imagine the world of, the, of my next novel. But I, it's been hard. What about you, Amy? Yeah, well, you made me feel, when we talked about this earlier today, you made me feel better for not being as productive as I would like right now and remembering <laughs> You have that, a newborn, you have yes. infants. Oh, so that definitely makes it a lot, it makes it, it's challenging. Um, just before the stay at home orders were in place, we started going, cause we haven't started daycare or anything yet. We started going to this uh, work play space and I was having a lot of trouble getting into the, the research cause it is like just reading dense books is my least favorite stage of the research. Um, so it was really effective cause I, uh, our son Wesley would be in the, the front in the play area and then I would be in the back in the work area and we could just uh, drop in for a couple hours a day so it worked out perfectly but then all of a sudden we're home with um, uh, you know other than my partner and I with no no help so it's uh it's been hard to find the time I mean I think I think it's good I don't know if, if you had this Angie when your your book first came out but I think it's it's good when a, a book comes out to have part of your brain in another project yeah. to, you know, cause all the advice that I've gotten from career authors is that, that writing is a career, you know, people love the, like, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And yeah. so I think that there's, you know, I at least had this feeling before the second book and now the third where it's like, can I really do this again? Um, and so having sort of having the process already going is helpful, but uh, promoting a book is, takes a lot of it is it is um a lot of time and it's a lot of energy and i find these 
there's things about doing things over Zoom as opposed to in person, which are great. The fact that people from all over can attend and people who couldn't, you know, even if it's not just a proximity issue, people who wouldn't or couldn't attend in person can still come. So I think there's lots of, of uh, great qualities to them, but I find that it takes me a while to like prepare for them. And then afterwards, I don't really, my creative juice is like drained. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's hard to, it's hard to do both. But I think for me, I don't know if this happens for you. I'm starting to get to the point where I feel it's almost like a physical feeling of like, I haven't written for so long. I feel like I need to get back into it. And that kind of guilt, I guess that, uh, it, that will help me find a way to definitely get started again. Yeah, definitely. I feel that too. Well, those are all of the questions that we had in the chat. Does anyone else have any final questions that they wanted to direct to our authors tonight? Um, while people are mulling that over, I just want to point out, I did share the link um, to order books from Inkwood Books in Haddonfield. Um, they set up a special page just for these ladies' books. So check that out and I will send it afterwards. Um, we got, that was amazing and interesting. It certainly was. Um, <laughs> thank you so much to both of you for being here. Um, this, is, this has been truly a delight and we, we in Cherry Hill really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who attended virtually as well. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. And I wish you yes. both well, and I look forward to reading both of your new books when you're done. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah, anytime. You're, well, you're both welcome back virtually or in person when that's a possibility again someday, yes. anytime. <laughs> Definitely. Can't wait. Yes. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks to everybody, and, and have a great, great night, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye.